A challenge in behaviour is any behaviour that an individual or team considers to be a problem to them. It may be hard to think of a relative who is an older adult as being challenging. However, a small percentage may present behaviours that are a challenge to us. This may be influenced by changes over time or the onset of conditions and can result in confusion, stubbornness, anxiety or aggression. In our experience, it will relate to what we perceive the behaviour to be and what our tolerance is. It will vary between individuals, families and staff teams. The sorts of uh, situations that tend to give rise to challenging behaviour are usually those that take place within the context of confrontation. So confrontation between clients, confrontation between staff and clients and so forth. The behavioural challenges I face in working with older adults with cognitive decline are mostly wandering and the risk of getting lost and unsteady gates and then you've got the risk of falling. The level of behavioural difficulties that you will often find varies. Um, you know, they take place in, in all contexts. They'll take place in um, continuing care provision, mental health provisions in particular. Um, they'll also take place in normal residential environments uh, and they'll also take place within the context of the home. What are the challenges that we face? It's important to understand that behaviour doesn't occur in a vacuum. You know, we, we behave in accordance with the relationships that we have in the way in which we communicate with each other. So behaviour, even challenging behaviour, is likely to be stimulated by another person's communication. There are some exceptions to that, of course, particularly in cases where people may be hallucinating or they have delusions. But outside that, we have two people who are communicating with each other and it's the meaning that the parties give to that communication that's important. Even in cases of dementia or other forms of progressive brain damage, people still attribute meaning to communication and that's very important. I think working with the elderly, there are different considerations to an extent. One is our view of the elderly uh, as, as, as a population. I think we've a very often a, 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 a myth which sometimes staff buy into that elderly people will be quiet and gentle and withdrawn and sit there watching EastEnders and that will be it. And the challenge will be at a very low level. In fact... Um, it can be as great as in any other area of, of um, mental health or learning disabilities and perhaps more shocking because it's older people who are the perpetrators. Research shows that our perception of the behaviour affects the way we manage situations. What influences our perception? Past history and a bad experience. Negative information. Fatigue, tolerance, confidence and knowledge of the reasons for the behaviour. The sorts of reasons why challenging behaviours occur in older people um, may be slightly different to, to the reasons that they may occur in, in, in younger people. It's less likely that older people will experience or um, express behavioural difficulties that have been learned um, as a way perhaps of, of coping with institutional care or as sort of long-term products of long-term personality difficulties. It's more likely the case that older people are likely to present behavioural problems because there's some sort of underlying um, mental health difficulty that they're experiencing and that their way of coping with the way in which they understand their environments is quite normal. These behaviours tend to occur because there is a cognitive decline. Um, you've got limited space on a ward which causes agitation. Um, patients 
aren't always aware of where they are, they're quite disorientated, so they might be looking for home, but if you ask them where home was, they wouldn't know. Uh, so very often, the first... Um, uh, the first factor uh, involved in, in training is a concentration on sort of breaking down those barriers, actually looking at what people who are older, older adults are capable of. Behaviours occur for a number of reasons. There is research-based evidence that a reactive plan or strategy is important in managing situations. But what should these plans or strategies consist of? We know that understanding behaviour helps staff to manage it and will reduce the frequency of incidents. But how can we gain an understanding or perspective? What in your experience winds people up? Nurses' attitudes, treating them as infants, um, controlling language, invading their personal space, limited space on a, within a ward environment and other patients you know who may be equally as confused it's important not to assume that you know what's going on for the clients it's important therefore to try and understand what they're expressing what they're experiencing and that ultimately is about knowledge of the clients and understanding the behavior in terms of solutions to their underlying needs at, the, at that particular time. They're struggling. They're struggling with trying to make sense of what's actually happening to them. So um, one of the most important ways of addressing that issue is to adopt a, an approach that is non-challenging, that is non-threatening. Well, I think there's a, world, a wide variety of, of things. Uh, I guess, though, it's the same for our clients as it is for you and I. Um, I mean, confrontation winds people up. Demands uh, tend to wind people up. Uh, situations where I think they and we feel helpless tends to, to get people agitated and aggressive. An essential part of reactive planning is knowing the person. Therefore, we are able to predict what may wind them up. We know that many behaviours are long-standing. While longer-term proactive planning can help day-to-day -day management, it is essential to have short-term reactive plans. These address situations when people are becoming upset and what to do when they become aggressive. Our reactive plans should contain a collection of behaviour management strategies which focus on avoiding conflict. We should be aware of the triggers that may inflame an existing situation, for example through touch or eye contact. We must be careful not to pass on an arousing non-verbal message or adopt an aggressive posture or tone of voice. Where possible, demands should be reduced or removed. Let's look at a situation. Come on, it's half past nine. The night staff will be on in a minute. Time for bed. <laughs> Somebody's stolen my money! <laughs> no one's stolen your money. No one's even been near your bag. Oh, no, you're calling me a liar! Oh. Get off! Get off! Get off! What has caused Mary to be upset? How could the situation be managed better? The incident clearly shows the rising emotion, the arousal level, and then the behaviour. The incident may damage the relationships between those involved. The member of staff is not listening to Mary. She warns, threatens, and increases her arousal level. Mary is confused, but she is also being protective of her property. Now let's look at this again and apply the principles of low arousal. You ready for bed, Mary? Somebody's stolen my money. Well, as it happens, while I was cleaning earlier, I found some money. Oh, do you think it could be yours? Oh, thank you so much. That's okay. Now I can go shopping. You ready for bed then? Yes, please. This time, the staff member has planned for this situation. She listens and is able to show Mary's money to her. This reassures her. 
does it really matter if Mary's purse has not been stolen? Sometimes not challenging a confused individual can help avoid hostility and aggression. This approach is based on finding the least aversive way of solving the problem. OK, the bus is here. Bye, George. Here is another example. Mary, what are you doing? I've Where got are you to going? go. I've got to go home. My mother's waiting for me. No, Mary. No, Mary. You live here. You're not going anywhere. Oh, yes, I am. She, she'll be cross if I don't go Mary, home. No, you're not going anywhere. Leave me alone. Mary, George doesn't ah! live here. Mary. What could be done to avoid Mary becoming upset when other residents are going home? OK, the bus is here. Bye, George. Mary, what are you doing? I've Where got are you to going? go. I've got to go home. My mother's waiting for me. No, Mary. No, Mary. You live here. You're not going anywhere. Oh, yes, I am. She, she'll be cross if I don't go Mary, home. We Mary, know that Mary is likely to do this. Alone and so she could be distracted Mary, before the others get ready to leave. Mary, come on. She will need reassurance Mary, and support at this time. It's the bus here. It'll be here in just a minute. OK. Mary? How would you like to go into your bedroom and have a look at some photos? Oh, I'd like that. Thank you ever so much. I haven't seen them for a long time. These situations could be easily avoided. Oh, this example this. is more successful oh, because it is less confrontational and attempts to accommodate yeah. Mary's frustration, anxiety oh, and confusion. And that's my mother. Talking about my past mother. events is a safe subject for older people as their distant memory tends to be more reliable. Distraction in low arousal theory means changing the focus of attention away from the cause of upset. Where are my slippers? I say, where are my slippers? They're on your feet. No, Mrs. James has stolen them. Mrs. James is dead. No, no, she's not. She's stolen my slippers. Oh, oh, don't she stole them? Where are my slippers? I say, where are my slippers? They're on your feet. No, Mrs. James is stolen. Mary is confused, but the staff member is no, distracted she she and fails to recognise that Mary is getting oh. upset. In this example, we consider Mary's paranoia and deal with it by adopting a less confrontational manner. I say, where are my slippers? Mary, you're wearing them. No, no, Mrs. James has stolen them. The member of staff is now helping Mary with her confusion by listening to her and taking her to a familiar environment to aid her memory. What we know from the latest research is that one of the main factors that influence um, consequent aggressiveness from the clients is the way in which we actually try and make sense of that other person's behaviour. If we see the person as being controlling or manipulative in some way, the research has shown that we are more likely to behave in a manipulative or punitive way ourselves. The frequency of these problems is constant sometimes with some patients um, especially if you're trying to you know to preserve the dignity and respect then you've got to allow them some freedom so you know they are fairly common problems there's something about how we understand the clients and how we understand the motive behind their behavior so clearly having a more appropriate understanding of the clients is very very important very often, I think, staff can cope with um, violence and one-off violence uh, quite well. But it's when there's a background level of violence, a sort of atmosphere of violence, that's when difficulties really occur. Because at those times, um, staff never know what to expect. 
there's something hanging over them, there's, there's, there's something in the background, and that can be very difficult. Spades, clubs, kings, diamonds. Leave that alone. Oh, she's got nice legs. That's personal! Some people's behaviour is an expression of emotion or an attempt to communicate. They may be unable to express their feelings, needs or frustrations. Behaviour occurs in the context of powerful emotions. For example, anxiety, anger, craving... These make demands upon our central nervous system to fight or flee, to get our needs or wants met, or to have our say on injustice. A large proportion of challenging behaviours are preceded by a demand or a request. As we react to situations, our arousal level rises, slowly at first and then steeply. This will result in a set of behaviours that have been learned or evolved in order to vent our feelings. They avoid a demand, allow us to get our way or fulfil a need. I think uh, as with any of us, we uh, need to be treated with respect, we need to be given choice and we need to have uh, active control over their life. And, and um, I think as with any of us, when those things don't happen, they can become frustrated, aggressive, and uh, often uh, up, up, uh, depressed. Patients prefer to be treated as adults and as individuals with their own unique needs, and for nurses to treat them with dignity and respect. The way in which people would most normally like to be treated if they're upset is by respect. And I think, as a general rule of thumb, one should reflect upon one's own way of thinking in these circumstances. If you're feeling upset or annoyed or challenged in some way, the last thing you need is for somebody else to be threatening or controlling or punitive in return. And I think, you know, the whole notion of respectful communication, listening to somebody, um, calling them by their preferred name, uh, communicating them... in with them in a way that uh, is, is, is non-threatening, so soft voice, etc., are very, very important issues. In all the examples, a good attitude combined with a positive relationship is a strength. Involving people in meaningful activities is an essential tool of management. In many cases, developing predictable routines which incorporate both light physical exercise and relaxation has proved to be useful. We also know that developing appropriate environments helps us to reduce incidents. The colours in a room, or a familiar smell or sound, can help people to make sense of their world. A consistent approach is essential. At its foundations, low arousal is about valuing people and not losing sight of the fact that we are all individuals. Successful care is based upon a good relationship with the clients. Once behavioural problems start to occur, they can cause rifts, even in the most professional people. They can cause rifts and damage that very important relationship. So low arousal theory enables us to create a culture for caring together. On the ward where I work, we are committed to using a low arousal technique and we have found that it has reduced incidents of challenging situations and I, th I think with with the training it has heightened nurses awareness of the need to use low arousal technique. Working with feelings is extremely important and that's why when uh, you're working with a client who you see or understand as beginning to be a little bit aggressive it's important to reflect upon your own way of communicating with them and saying, you know, am I being threatening to this person? What other approach can I use? And address the feelings. So, for example, you seem to be 
upset at the moment or is there anything I can help you with or come and have a look at these photographs that we've got over here. Very subtle but very important ways of diffusing a threatening situation.